Oh, this is going to be good. I believe it's going to be life-changing. As always, God's word never returns empty or void. So let's ask him for his help. Precious Heavenly Father, you've given us Jesus, your son, to save us, to deliver us. And Lord, he sent the Holy Spirit on assignment to show us things to come, to unfold the word of God, the word of your mystery in our lives, that we might know the treasure map of your blessing and always arrive on time in Jesus' precious name. We receive your help, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Ultimate Living Part 3. Oh, this is going to be so good. This is an on-time word for you, for your family, for your home. I believe this with all of my heart. Ultimate Living Part 3. How to overcome ultimate living aversion how to overcome ultimate living aversion. So let's do a quick review of parts one and two. Part one, we define ultimate living, right? Realizing that everything that God has made, it's cycles. It's like breathing. So ultimate living must have the flow of ultimate giving to complement that cycle of in and out. We also laid hold of God's will for our lives with 3 John 2. Ultimate living is the whole pie and not just a slice here and a crumb there, right? And in part two, we learn that God customizes. I love that. God customizes ultimate living for your identity, who you are. He doesn't treat you randomly. No, no, no. You're not just part of the crowd. Jesus taught us on stewardship and he equips us with authority to live life strong. Now, in this session, let's deal with a challenge. Many people struggle in living life and dealing with this. It's ultimate living aversion and how to overcome it. It's a spiritual disorder. I don't know if you've ever heard of food aversion. Listen to this. Pam and I were talking with some very dear friends of ours about the challenge their little boy has because he struggles with this thing called food aversion. It's a disorder making it so that he's got great difficulty eating foods because of the textures. It can be the taste. It can be the appearance and so on and so on. It could be one or several of these variables, but it's a disorder. It's not order or it right. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's a disorder. As you can imagine, this is not ultimate living because there are very healthy foods that this little guy needs for the sake of nutrition and also so that he can enjoy what God has made for him. His parents utilize therapy to help him overcome these challenges. And his therapists, they're amazing. They practice something called food chaining exercises with him. This helps him to reprogram his thinking about certain textures, tastes, smells, and appearances. Here are just a few of the exercises that they try to accomplish with this sweet little guy. They do the touch the food with his hands thing. Yes, that's right. They, they encourage him to play with his food. Just touch it. Just play with it. Then they try this. Put the food to his lips and play a game where he kisses the food just to put it to his lips. Then another thing they try is get him to lick it just to introduce the taste. They'll also have him try to put a bite mark on the food and again, making it kind of like a game just to see if he can put a bite mark on the food. And then another thing they do, that it's even a win for them if they can encourage him to bite the food and just spit it out. Bite a chunk and just spit it out. That's a win. All of these efforts and these games and the playing are meant to help him overcome what they know is a disorder, an aversion to something that he should want to eat. He should want this. It's the process of overcoming the aversion. Oftentimes, children with a food aversion develop what is called a jag, a jag. The term food jag refers to the practice of eating just one food over and over. Same food. For instance, a child may only want to eat French fries for every meal or a certain type of cereal. That's all they'll eat, that cereal. Now, you and I may not be nutritionists, but we can see that this is not a habit for ultimate living outcome. Saying no to all the good food and the nutritious food is not the ideal for living a healthy life, right? 
Besides, you don't want to grow up and go to your boss's house someday for your big promotion dinner where he's serving steak and lobster, but you say, no thanks, I, I'll just have my bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios because, well, nobody can say no to Honey Nut Cheerios, right? There was this woman named Heather who for her entire pregnancy could not even think of the word pasta or she would start gagging, choking. And she totally, you have to understand this, before she got pregnant, she loved pasta. Heather's temporary food aversion even became a word aversion for her. Think of this. The Bible identifies something called sin. It's a deadly spiritual disorder, disease, that promotes a disorder that is a life aversion. You would think that everyone would jump at God's invitation to ultimate living. No, they don't. They don't. Many of us have an ultimate living aversion. And to go along with it, we have a sin jag. We find the texture of the word blessing offensive. Blessing. Oh, prosperity. You know, oh, I, I can't believe I just said the P word. You see, there are religious people that get highly offended with either the B word, blessing, or the P word, prosperity. They just, it's a, it's an aversion they've got. We need therapy with God's wisdom and his word to gain the ability to handle the texture of truth, to get used to the law of life in Christ Jesus. Culture has worked so hard to normalize immorality, sin, even in religion. We've developed an aversion to truth, life, morality, character, God's goodness. And instead, we get a jag of my truth. I only eat my truth, my truth. My friend, the word blessing is not a curse word. It's not even four letters. Just because somebody uses a chainsaw in a horror movie, it doesn't mean that chainsaws are evil. We passively let society with media rewrite our terms until we lose a handle on what truth really is, what it means. In part one, we introduce God's profound desire, his wish, his will for you, right? Out of 3 John 2. I know for some, this can make you squeamish. It's true. Yes, just like that pregnant woman with the word pasta. Oh, right? It's strange and it's so bizarre, but people are complicated. You're complicated. You have a complicated design. So let's try this truth again. Because believe God, you're designed for this reality. Here we go. Buckle up. 3 John 2, beloved, I wish above all things, God says, that you would prosper in every way, not one way, in every way, and that your body may keep well, even as your soul, that's your mind, will, and emotions, keeps well and prospers. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, that just seems, well, you, you know, that just seems unspiritual to me. P prosper? I mean, like, that can't be in the Bible. You mean the, the word prosper? That bothers your spiritual taste buds, your senses? So should we rewrite the Bible to accommodate your spiritual food aversion? Of course not. You know that. I know you would say no to that. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, to a woman, and appears straight before them, but at the end of it is the way of death. You can't go by what seems right to you. You've got a life aversion. You can't trust you. Do you hear me? You can't trust you. That means you can't trust your feelings, your sensitivities. You have got a word aversion, a truth aversion. Well, now, Pastor Steve, I've just got to trust my heart. Oh, really? And how's that working out for you? Come on, be honest. That's why Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All of your heart, because that's truly ultimate living. Now, if the devil cannot stop you from being blessed, that's because Jesus defeated him at the cross, right? So if the devil cannot stop you from being blessed, but you can stop you because believing is essential to receiving, wouldn't the devil work to help you to stop you? How? Simple. 
He'll help you adopt a spiritual aversion to the truth, God's truth, a word aversion to blessing. Therefore, all blessing verses in the Bible don't work for you. Prosperity. Therefore, all prosperity verses don't work for you because you've got a oh, prosperity. Oh, dear, right? What an awful word, said every farmer who prefers to plant seed and have nothing come up out of the ground, right? How ridiculous. It's spiritual stupidity, my friend. The devil, the enemy of our soul, loves to promote spiritual religious jags. So let's dial in on this term, spiritual jag. Remember, a food jag is the practice of eating just one food over and over and over and over, over and over. Same French fry, over, just want that, those type of French fries. That's it, over and over and over. Your enemy delights in you adopting these Christianese spiritual jag phrases like, I've heard Christians eating on this. Well, well, the Lord just loves me just the way I am. It's just, he loves me just the way I am. Well, of course he does. But why in the world would he leave you the way you are, right? He's got great plans for you, but they require transformation. How about this spiritual food jag? Well, I'm under God's grace. Yeah, but that's not an excuse to just stay the way you are or just to live in sin or just to do whatever you feel like you wanna do. That grace is not an excuse or a spiritual license to sin. How about here's another food jag? I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Pastor Stephen, that's all I am, an old sinner saved by grace. Just listen to yourself. You've got this broke down, disgusting sound to your voice, and yet you say you possess God's amazing grace. You can't be both. You're either a child of God or you're a broke down. You got it, right. And here's another one. Well, I'm just suffering for Jesus. Just suffering for Jesus. Well, how about living for Jesus? Be a Romans 12, 2 example of a renewed mind proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You see, these are spiritual jag types. You're feeding on something that you've grown accustomed to. It's traditional, maybe in your family or life, but it's not giving you any life. There's no nutrition in it. There's no anointing. There's no help or ultimate living. It's really just an excuse to say, I can't give because I've got nothing of the blessing to give. I've got no abundant life to give, so therefore I'm recused from this exercise. Look, our carnal nature easily becomes hooked on sin, spiritual jags. We chase what hurts us. It could be a drug. It could be a relationship. At the end of the day, it's a spiritual jag. Look, you'd think that we naturally wouldn't want to engage in something that destroys our life, ruins our relationships, cuts off access to God's presence, but we're all born with this sin disorder, all of us. In one way or another, we can get weird about God's goodness, His life, God's true ultimate living. We need to get free from this ultimate living aversion. So how do we overcome the ultimate living aversion, right? How do we do this? In the natural, a therapist helps a child overcome food aversions by having them spend time with good food. Touch it, handle it, examine it, touch it to your lips, lick it, bite it, taste it. Hmm, I wonder if God gives us any such therapy to learn to overcome our aversion to blessing. Hmm, Psalm 34 verse eight, listen to this. Oh, taste and see. Let me say it again. Oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. How blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the man, is the woman who takes refuge in God. God is telling us to taste and see that he's good. He's fully aware of our life aversion disorders. He knows we need help. Look, he knows you need help. God knows we all need new thinking because otherwise we can't even really hear what he's saying because we're spitting on terms like bless. God says, I want to bless you. And we're like, right? Come on, Isaiah 55 verse seven. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man or woman his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have love, pity and mercy for him and to our God for he will multiply to him his abundant pardon. Listen, 
I know Christians that don't mind Jesus saving them from hell, but they don't want God to guide their life decisions because ultimately they're like, they like their thinking better than God's thinking. Is that you? Do you like your thinking better than God's thinking? Yes, some people want to hold on to their spiritual jags. They're comfortable with their dysphoria, their disorder. That's mine. It's my truth. Now they don't realize those things are causing them great fear, unrest, torment, brokenness, heartache. Instead, they buy into one or two of their spiritual jags and they say things like this. Well, the Lord helps those who help themselves. And then they say things like, well, some things we just won't know until the sweet by and by. Then they say things like this, ah, oh, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Who knows what the Lord's gonna do? I wonder what the Bible's for. Then they say things like this, well, in the sweet by and by. Now, I don't know what, but in the sweet by and by. Now, look, if I've hit on a few of your jags or your spiritual aversions to life, please don't get offended. I don't wanna hurt you. I don't want you upset but I do want you to get some heavenly word of God therapy right now because your life matters. As I've said, it's really an excuse to say, look, I've got nothing of the blessing to give, nothing of his abundant life to give. You see, this excuse is ultimately the death of you because it stops the cycle of spiritual breathing. The ventilation we talked about in part two. The first thing Jesus asked the woman in John 4 at the well was, give me a cup of water. Jesus asked her for a cup of water. You see, your life thirst is ultimately quenched in giving, not taking, in giving. When you're thirsty, I mean desert dry thirsty, there's nothing you wouldn't give for that life water. Listen to Jesus address that thirst in John 7, verses 37 and 38. Now, on the final and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. Jesus always teaches us that what is received is meant to flow out. Jesus is teaching us here that life moves and flows from the inside out. That's how life flows. Acts 20 verse 35, it says, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Receiving isn't bad. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying that the power is in the giving. The blessing is in the giving. We're born grasping, grabbing, consuming, demanding and then Jesus comes along to us, and when we are reborn, we're reborn for giving, growing, discerning, multiplying, and yes, ultimate living. But you have to be authorized, licensed for ultimate living. It's like you need to be licensed to drive. Many people don't understand that being born again is truly being authorized for life. When the curse of sin came into the world through the sin of Adam and Eve, humanity lost its license for ultimate living. Jesus came to get us our authority back for living and for giving. You see, a lot of people give for one reason or another in the world, but without being reborn. It doesn't do their eternal existence any good. They're not authorized. They're not licensed for ultimate living. So they never seem to get there. Over and over in the Gospels, we see Jesus prefacing a miracle by saying, so that you might know the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, so that you might know the Son of Man has authority on earth, then he would always say that before things like where he would forgive and he would heal the paralyzed man, or where he prophesied of dying on the cross and taking his life back again. Jesus, the perfect Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, the last Adam, as the Bible calls him, came to earth to get us our God-given authority back so that we can live as sons and daughters of God. Jesus restored the Genesis 126 gift of complete authority back to the species of mankind. We get to live the ultimate life in Christ Jesus, finally and officially licensed to drive. Oh, Pastor Stephen, that it all just sounds so strange to me. I see it in the Bible, but why should I why should it even matter to me? And why does it seem so foreign to me? Well, my friend, that's kind of a healthy attitude to be completely honest with you. 
When you're used to the world's way, the Bible calls that carnal thinking, that's what seems natural to you. So to confess that God talk doesn't seem natural to you, I think that's very transparent. Now, think of that precious little boy with the food aversion. You may know a healthy salad is delicious, right? We both know that. You may think a gourmet meal is delicious and even a blessing, a nutritional blessing to a person. But until that little boy is helped to overcome his food aversion, he cannot and he will not enjoy what you and I know is healthy for him. What you know to be a blessing, good, helpful for growth, strength, enjoyable even, dare I say it, blessed, prosperous. So just like his therapist gives him practical things to work on to overcome the food aversion, let me give you a few practical things that you can do to calibrate, to recalibrate your thinking, to overcome any aversion to God's life for you, to overcome any ultimate living aversion that you may struggle with, because it's very understandable that you're struggling with some spiritual food aversions, some difficulties with words like prosperity and blessing. Listen to this. Number one, going back right to God's word, taste and see. That's your first step. You got to just taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste it. Speak the will of God out loud so that you can hear it and taste it. Quote 3 John 2. That's been kind of a theme verse throughout this series, but quote 3 John 2 and then just say, say it out loud. That's God's will for my life. I believe that. God said it, so I believe it, and I receive it. Taste and see. Then number two, listen. Listen to yourself saying that verse. In fact, I dare you to take your phone and record yourself reading 3 John 2. Record yourself and then listen to you speaking that verse in life. Listen to yourself. And then number three, search. This is such a key. You've got to search for another verse, another truth from God's word that complements that verse. I, I mean, I might steer you just with your homework. You might look at Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. You might look at Psalm 1, verse 3, or 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Those are just a few, but there's hundreds of verses that would confirm that. But search, search for another truth out of God's word that complements 3 John 2. And then number four, give. Give cheerfully. Give cheerfully that as you have received. Don't give something that you don't have, but give cheerfully as you've received. Remember the widow in Luke 21. She gave even out of her need all she had, and it grabbed the attention of Jesus. It grabbed the attention of heaven. If God's word and gift of salvation are of any value to you, practice ultimate living by giving. Jesus said this in Luke 6, verse 38. He said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto you. But he said, Give, give. Nobody in the world, in the universe, or in all of the galaxies has given like Jesus. Jesus is an expert on giving. Jesus knows a little something, something, something about ultimate living, and he spoke often on giving. Look, we have a lot of people very angry in this world. Their heart and their soul has closed in on them. Their hopelessness is a vacuum pulling in the hostility, hostility toward themselves and then hostility toward others. They're giving, but they're giving from the hostility. The remedy to not living is, and it will always be, giving, giving. You can undo the spiritual atrophy in your soul right now. Overcome your life aversion by surrendering to Jesus and the power, the authorization of his word for your life. Step into the ultimate living right now with this act of faith. Give Jesus your life. Renew your heavenly expectation in his plan for your life. Pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I want your plans for my life. I want your ultimate living. Jesus gave everything for me. He died on the cross. He was buried in the grave. 
After three days, you raised him up again. Now he reigns as king of eternity. I confess all my sins. Cleanse me from all my life aversions. Renew my mind. Here's my life. Now I receive your life. All your amazing grace for me, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.